In the last few videos, we've been talking about substitutions in multiple integrals, specifically in double integrals. In this video, I want to start talking about substitutions in triple integrals. So let's say we had the triple integral of f of x with over this region b in space. So I've drawn a little region b over here, and I haven't indicated any axes, but this is what I'm considering b to be. We want to do a substitution. So x equals g of uvw, where uv and w are my new variables. y is equal to h, and z is equal to k, all on those three new variables, where uvw uh, gives me a region g in uvw space. All right, so this is the region I start with, and then this is the region g. And I've drawn an arrow this way because this set of functions would map g back to b, right? Thinking of b as a pre-image. Well, my substitution rule is very much the same as my substitution rule for double integrals. I take my functions and I plug them into the function, right? I take the substitutions and I plug them in and I evaluate. And then I have times the absolute value of a Jacobian. So here's my Jacobian, which looks just like the Jacobian for two variables. I just need to have one more partial and one more row. So a column for a partial with respect to w and the extra row for the z's. And then my new variables. So we need to do examples. We need to actually evaluate a triple integral using a substitution. But I thought in this video we would just find a Jacobian. But more than that, I thought we'd find the Jacobian for a substitution that we've used already. So I know to go from rectangular to spherical coordinates, I would use this substitution. Where my new variables are rho, phi, and theta. And so I'll calculate a Jacobian, j of rho, phi, and theta. And we know what we're supposed to get, which is really nice. In the end, I know I'm supposed to get rho squared sine phi because I already know that extra factor for dv uh, when I convert a triple integral from rectangular to spherical coordinates. So, across this top row, I'm taking partials of x, first with respect to rho, where we get sine phi cosine theta. Then with respect to phi, where we get rho cosine phi cosine theta. And then finally, with respect to theta, where we get minus rho sine phi sine theta. Now I need to do the same thing for y. So the partial with respect to rho sine phi sine theta with respect to phi, rho cosine phi sine theta, and then finally with respect to theta. So I would get rho sine phi cosine theta. Now finally, the partial in the last column, I take the partial of z with respect to rho, so cosine phi, with respect to phi minus rho sine phi, and then finally with respect to theta, and I get a zero. And so when I go to take this determinant, I recommend expanding over the last row here because that zero gets rid of one term I have to worry about. When expanding over this last row, if I think about this, this is the third spot in the first column, so I add one and three and I get four, the first term is going to be positive. The next term, this is two and three, five, I, I get a minus there. So to expand over the first, excuse me, the last row, I have cosine of phi times, and now I need to take the determinant of the two by two of the little matrix up here in the top right-hand corner. And so I need to be careful with all of my um, terms here and make sure I don't lose anything, a sine or a trig function or a row. And so I multiply these together, I'm definitely gonna get a row squared, I will have a sine phi and a cosine phi and a cosine squared theta. All right, plus, because it's a minus of a minus, a row squared, and I have sine phi and cosine phi again. And then on the end, I'd have a sine squared theta. And that's gonna be really nice because I see a sine squared and a cosine squared. So I think I know what's gonna 
happen there. And now I need to think about this next spot. So it would be minus that minus rho. So plus rho sine phi times the determinant of the matrix I get when I take out the bottom row in the middle column. So I multiply these two things together and I get a row sine squared phi cosine squared theta minus, but it's really going to be a plus row sine squared phi and then sine squared theta. All right, so I need to simplify that expression. And what I notice is that I have something times cosine squared plus the same something times sine squared. So I could imagine factoring away the rho squared sine phi cosine phi, and that would just give me cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So I end up with that thing. So let's see, that's co cosine phi times, and then on the inside there, I'd have rho squared sine phi cosine phi. And so I'm gonna just write that as a cosine squared phi in a moment, but I'll just go on and move to the next term for now. I have that rho sine of phi out front, and then I can use that same idea of that Pythagorean identity, right? I factor that out front, and then what's left in the parentheses is cosine squared plus sine squared is one. And so I have rho sine squared phi. So let's see if I can rewrite this just a little bit. I have a rho squared sine phi times cosine squared phi plus, and we might be tempted to write that as a sine cubed, but I'm just gonna write as a rho squared sine phi times sine squared phi, because now I have something in both places times cosine squared and times sine squared. I can factor that part out and then I'd have cosine squared plus sine squared is one, and so I don't need that, and there I have it. I found that value, rho squared sine phi, that appears in my spherical coordinate triple integrals.